So, today's talk, Inspiration from Creation. Uh, there are four parts to the talk. The first part, I'll explain why engineers are eager to copy designs from the natural world. Then secondly, why bio-inspiration is so relevant to the creation-evolution debate, because it shows whether there is a designer or not. Then thirdly, I'll present some of my own research uh, to show you some of the excitement there is in working in bio-inspiration. And then fourthly, I'll talk a bit about the origins uh, battle, why this is such an important battle today, and I'll give you some uh, examples of myself being on the front line and uh, I've been a bit closer to the front line than I really would have wanted but I'll explain more about that later. So the first part of the talk, introduction to bio-inspiration. Uh, bio-inspiration is now inspiring many, many new technologies and you can look at journals like uh, these journals here dedicated to reporting hundreds of examples of engineers copying designs from the natural world. I'm actually co-editor of that journal on the right-hand side. So it's a really important new technology. Uh, the reason it's important, engineers want to make smaller air vehicles for reconnaissance and security applications, uh, for the fire rescue service, for military applications, and engineers are seeing the best way to produce better micro-air vehicles is to copy uh, designs from nature like dragonflies and I'm going to show you my personal research in that area. Engineers are eager to make lighter exoskeletons for biomedical applications and again copying from nature and I'll give you examples of my own research and engineers want to make stronger knee joints. Again copying designs from nature and these three case studies I'm going to present in this talk. This year I had another grant, uh, probably the best grant I've ever had. I was approached by Team GB, the Olympic cycling team. They asked me to redesign their transmission for the Rio de Janeiro Olympics in 2016. And for that they give me free tickets for the World Championships and Olympics, which is quite nice. Uh, here's a picture of me holding a very expensive uh, racing frame in my back garden, and I'm using bio-inspiration for this project. I would love to uh, tell you what I'm doing, but I'm sworn to secrecy on this project, especially if I'm anywhere near an Australian. They have told me, do not say anything to anyone from Australia. Um, I'm actually very grateful to Australians because Australia beat Team GB in the Commonwealth Games. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted Team GB to lose before I put my transmission on their bikes. So when we beat Australia in the Olympics in 2016, uh, sorry, but we will, uh, then they can give me credit for the new transmission. So thank you very much to Australia. Just to mention a bit about my qualifications, uh, as uh, was mentioned already, I'm a professor of engineering design. I've held head of department positions. I've also lectured and researched at Cambridge University in the UK, probably the best university in the world. I've published uh, a lot of papers, as David was saying, published several patents, and also had several national uh, awards. One of them was the Wessex Scientific Medal for Bio-Inspired Design. Uh, I apologize for dwelling on my uh, awards. Academics tend to do this. But there is a serious point here. Sometimes the media will say that creation <coughs> scientists do not publish peer-reviewed work, uh, don't do top scientific work, but that is not true. I, I'm not just saying that about myself, but there are many uh, creation scientists who do excellent uh, work. I've also been awarded Turner's Gold Medal, the top design medal in the United Kingdom. That was for spacecraft rocket design. I worked for the European Space Agency, uh, worked on several spacecraft projects, including the Envisat satellite, the largest civilian satellite in the world. It's so big, it w it's bigger than this uh, room here. Uh, I was responsible for designing the solar array, uh, and that was the biggest ever designed and built, and for that I was awarded the gold medal. We called it Envisat, not just because it's an environmental satellite, there was actually a more important reason 
uh, the satellite is bigger than every single American NASA satellite. And NASA were very envious of us, so we called it EnviSat uh, for short. <laughs> it's not often uh, you can build something bigger than anything the Americans have built. So every time I go to America, uh, I dwell on this particular uh, slide. So secondly, bio-inspiration is very relevant to the origins debate. Why is that so? It reveals the truth about origins. Evolution predicts bad design in nature. Evolution is blind. If evolution were true, the whole of nature would have bad design. It would be very obvious. But in contrast, creation predicts supreme design in nature. If it's true that God has designed the world, you'd expect nature to have supreme design. Byron inspiration shows us what is found in nature, because bio-inspiration is what I call observational science, real science, experimental science, and it does tell you the truth about <coughs> origins. <coughs> Evolutionists argue that nature contains bad design. Now, have you heard of Richard Dawkins? Right, you, young man. Have you heard of Richard Dawkins? No? Well, Richard Dawkins is a very famous uh, atheist, evolutionist. He's written a lot. Uh, books like The Greatest Show on Earth, and he claims the world is full of bad design. He said this comment here, an incredible comment. Richard Dawkins said, the human eye, it's not just bad design, it's design of a complete idiot. I completely disagree with that. I think the eye is a wonderful design. Now, he hasn't shown that. It's just that he wants to believe it. And the reason he wants to believe it is because that is what evolution predicts. If evolution was true, the whole world would look as though it's designed by a complete idiot. So that's what he says in his books. Why is that? Evolution has to predict that because it is limited to step-by-step -step change. I teach engineering design to students. I've taught many hundreds, thousands of students. One of the things I tell my students Never limit yourself to step-by-step -step change, or you'll never design anything. You've got to use your creativity to put lots of components and parts together in one go. But evolution can't do that. And here's a wonderful admission by a leading evolutionist. The evolutionary process faces constraints far more severe than anything impeding human designers. That, that's an amazing admission by an evolutionist. If he really thinks about what he said, he would stop believing in evolution, because that means they can't produce anything. Uh, for example, this gearbox here, it's a gearbox with uh, worm gears and bearings, can you see that? That is an irreducible design. That is the gearbox that I got my gold medal for, the one I was mentioning earlier. That could never evolve by chance. That took a huge amount of creativity to produce that gearbox. Uh, sometimes engineers have this expression, scientists describe what is, engineers create what has never been before. It's a wonderful feeling to uh, create something like a brand new gearbox, never been there before. It could never evolve by chance, could never evolve step by step. Evolution can't do that. Evolution, if it could produce anything, I don't think it can. If it could, it would be so simple and clumsy. But evolution predicts bad design for a second reason. It cannot add beauty. It cannot add extra functionality. And evolutionists, again, will admit this is true. Here's another admission by leading evolutionist Stephen Jones. Uh, he said this, evolution does its job as well as it needs to and no more. And like the previous admission, if this guy really thought about what he's just said, and then open his eyes to the beauty of creation, he'd think, hang on, the world hasn't evolved. If he just thought about his own admission. Uh, I don't know if you see these around here. I hope you do. It's a Triumph motorbike. I currently work with Triumph motorbikes. They're wonderful motorbikes, more beautiful, more uh, elegantly sounding, with their great roar than they need to be. They're more comfortable than they need to be. In a way, they're more expensive than they need to be, but they're excellent value for money. I would recommend to get a Triumph uh, motorbike, great for touring uh, Australia. 
But evolution could never produce a beautiful motorbike like that because it cannot add beauty or functionality. So evolution predicts bad design. On the other hand, creation predicts supreme <coughs> design. God is not limited to step-by-step -step change. God's not limited to what is needed for survival. In fact, God's not limited at all. God is perfect in knowledge. In fact, that's what the Bible says. Do you know this Bible verse from the book of Job? Job chapter 37, verses 14 and 16. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God, who is perfect in knowledge. As a designer, I would be mad if I didn't study nature, something designed by God who is perfect in knowledge. And notice what it says. Stand still. Studying creation is not an optional extra for a Christian. It's not a hobby for enthusiasts. All of us are commanded, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. So now what we're going to do, I'm going to talk about the case studies I mentioned, my own personal research, and we're going to stand still. Well, you're going to sit still and I'm going to stand still and consider these wondrous works. So this is the third part. And I hope you find these case studies interesting. It's good to see children here today. I hope you concentrate and see some of the marvels of God's designs. The first project I had was a micro air vehicle inspired by dragonflies. I had a, a grant of about, well, the equivalent of half a million Australian dollars uh, to develop a little micro air vehicle that could fly around uh, a building for security and reconnaissance. Uh, you can't use helicopters, they're not very stable when you fly near uh, a wall or a ceiling. They're not very efficient either. They're also loud, they have other problems. So my project was to uh, study the dragonfly and produce a dragonfly-like air vehicle. It's really difficult because the way insects fly, they twist their wings. They don't just flap their wings up and down, they twist and flap their wings. And when an insect twists its wing, it twists it so much and so fast, in incredibly fast, it creates what we call a vortex, like a whirlwind. And you can see on this uh, picture the whirlwind started by the wing and then it goes around the back of the dragonfly, it creates this upthrust of uh, the insect, in, in this case a wasp, but it's the same for all insects, and it creates tremendous lift. Uh, engineers have only understood this in the last 15 years years. Before then it was a mystery why bumblebees could fly. So uh, in my group what we did, we uh, decided we would study the common European data dragonfly. The first thing I did, I got my researchers and students, had a team, and I said go out and capture some dragonflies. They took nets out in the university gardens. They really enjoyed that first part of the project, capturing the dragonflies. Then we put them inside pots and we've got a high-speed camera, very expensive camera, and uh, I'm going to show you what we filmed, uh, and this is greatly slowed down, it's slowed down by 40 times, because we found the dragonfly could beat its wings uh, 40 times per second. Now, you should be able to just see the dragonfly, and it, it looks as though it's one a second, it's actually 40 times a second it's beating its wings, and twisting, when we saw this, we saw the speed, and we saw the precision of design, and we saw the control and the elegance. We were amazed, and we were awestruck at the beauty and brilliance of this design. This is supposed to be a primitive creature, if you look in an evolution book, but it is brilliantly uh, designed. We were in awe. Uh, when we studied this in detail, one of our feelings was, well, we wanted to give up. Uh, how, could, how could we copy this miracle of design? Well, we couldn't give up. We already had the grant, so we had to uh, soldier on and see what we could do. So what we did, we did lots of measurements with stills of the video. We measured the flap angle being 80 degrees. We measured the angle of twist being 40 degrees. And we also recorded when the twist took place, which is actually the most important thing. If you don't twist in the right time, you don't get the vortex. And we measured the twist took place just before the wing changed direction. So we, we measured what the dragonfly 
does. We then decided we would uh, copy that. We copied the motion of the dragonfly. We couldn't go as fast. We could only go 10 times a second. But we, co we copied the angle. We copied the twist. We copied the position of the twist because the aerodynamics is so complicated uh, that the best thing you can do is just copy what is there in the natural world. And so we invented this uh, very original, novel mechanism. It's called a double crank rocker. The yellow crank rocker does the flapping, and the red crank rocker does the twisting. And we've got the 80 degrees flapping, and we've got the 40 degrees twisting. And the twisting happens just before wing reversal. There was a lot of brain power that went into uh, that very original mechanism. It's a wonderful thing to... It's a wonderful feeling when you have this great problem and then through creativity and sweat and perspiration you get this novel design. Engineers create what has never been. So that was a, a great step, getting the concept uh, right. We even noticed there was a four-bar mechanism inside the Dragonfly and we published that in journals uh, around the world. But that was our design. We then uh, designed the detail of it there were hundreds of precision components. The whole vehicle weighed 10 grams. You can see it in the hand of a person there. We got it up to 10 hertz. Uh, it looks, in some ways, it looks straightforward. You can see the computer-aided design. But there was a great challenge we weren't expecting. We hadn't realized how difficult it would be to assemble this micro air vehicle. This picture here gives you a glimpse. Up here is a hand and there are components. These are bolts, these are nuts, and we thought, how are we going to get nuts that are smaller than a pinhead? In fact, on the next picture, this is the hand. You can just see massive fingers. There are threads on this bolt, and that is a nut. That nut is smaller than a pinhead, and it has to be screwed onto a bolt. We hadn't realised this was going to be incredibly difficult. I had to get hold of Students with uh, small hands, good at origami. We had to get special magnifying glasses and tweezers. And it was really difficult uh, doing up bolts inside this. Uh, that, that ended up being the biggest challenge. And If you ever design something yourself, what you find is it's difficult. And you have more difficulties than you would have expected at the beginning. That was one of our difficulties. We then tested the mechanism to prove... There was a vortex coming off of the wings, so this was our device. We stuck it in a wind tunnel, did a very expensive test where you have this gush of air, you fill it with smoke, with lasers, um, an incredibly expensive test. And uh, from the, the movement of the smoke, we proved there was a vortex, a leading edge vortex coming off of our micro air vehicle. We were, and we believe we were the first in the world to demonstrate this on a man made micro air vehicle. So that was a great uh, sense of achievement at that point. We then did proper testing and here you can see the micro air vehicle flapping. You can see it flapping and twisting and it's doing it quite fast so it's not easy to follow the motion. When you hold it it's like it wants to take off. Um, the controllability uh, is an ongoing project. There's no one in the world who's yet has a flying controllable uh, air vehicle, but this is one of the leading ones uh, in the world. And just that one vehicle cost half a million Australian dollars. So if you'd like to put in any orders for one, uh, I'll be very happy to speak to you afterwards. Just want to mention a couple more uh, slides about micro air vehicles because we've also looked at bird inspired micro air vehicles. These are where uh, if you want to get a, a further distance, not just around a building, but if you want to get across a city or a town, um, like Port Augusta, if you want to fly across the whole town and have perfect camouflage, you really want your vehicle to be like a bird, like a seagull. And my contribution is I've looked at the <coughs> mechanism inside a bird wing for engineers to copy that for micro air vehicles. And for this, I had a grant from the Royal Academy of Engineering to go to the United States and we got hold of a ring build gull and here you can see we've got the wing off and we're moving the uh, humerus bone 
And we're de- what we're doing here, deploying the elbow bone to move the wrist bone. Because uh, if I show you with this little technique, what a bird does, it can move its elbow joint like that and see it automatically moves the wrist joint. So the wrist joint does not need any muscles and the wing is lighter and smoother. If I just play that, and here we're demonstrating that even with the wing off of a bird, we can move that four bar mechanism. The elbow joint is moving the wrist joint. And uh, we were the first researchers to demonstrate that on this type of bird. I also looked at the aerodynamic braking of that bird. When birds flap their wings, they do a very clever thing. After accelerating their wings with some energy, they don't decelerate their wings, they let go of their muscles and they let the air do the automatic deceleration and that saves energy. Biologists have known this but they've never known how much aerodynamic braking there is. This year I'm publishing a paper and it's the first ever paper to demonstrate how much aerodynamic braking there is in a bird. We did practical tests as you can see at the top, we did some spinning tests to work out drag coefficients, then I worked out this very special uh, equation that took a long time to produce, so I thought I would show it to you, even though I don't expect anyone to understand that. A lot of my colleagues don't un- understand it, hardly any biologist uh, understand it. I sometimes say to a, an evolutionist, a uh, biologist, um, how do you know aerodynamic braking could evolve by chance? And they say, well, we don't understand aerodynamic braking, we don't understand the first thing about that long equation you've got. And I say, well, if you don't understand aerodynamic braking, how do you know it could have evolved if you don't understand it? And they will often say, well, we have faith. Faith in evolution, that it could have evolved. If I talk about the vortex of the dragonfly, they say the same thing. They have faith. Well, uh, I've published uh, lots of papers. This is a sample of some of the papers I've published on this work. It's been published in New New Scientist, one of the top science Uh, magazines in the world. The last two papers, you notice, 2014. Uh, This was a good year to invite me. Um, A lot of my papers are coming out this year. These are top international uh, journals. The conclusion of those papers is there is supreme design in the natural world. Not bad design, supreme design. I wish I could have added a couple of sentences at the end of my papers... (coughs) And therefore, there is a creator, and he's great in wisdom and power, and we give him the glory, but I'm not allowed to do that, so I haven't. Having said I haven't, in my very early days, I did do it on one paper, and it got published, but no one, no evolutionist noticed uh, that, but so it is in print, but sadly, I can't, I would love to do it on every paper, to give God the glory. And as a Christian, I am just so encouraged to do this kind of work and to see God's hand in creation. But I have a couple of other uh, brief um, examples. One is a fish-inspired linear actuator. And for this, we were inspired by the sling jaw wrasse, a very special fish. You can see pictures here. The jaw comes out um, a long way. It's a really extraordinary uh, fish. And it's very good at catching prey and collecting food, and we knew this would be a really good uh, inspiration for better biomedical um, applications, like exoskeletons. A lot of people use exoskeletons, especially if they've had a stroke, to exercise their fingers and hands. And they're very heavy. They used to be really heavy. In 1965, they used to be that heavy. Uh, This is obviously a really strong man. He probably comes from Australia, and he's strong enough to hold this uh, exoskeleton and even makes it look as though he's not trying. Um, But today, the engineers are really trying to make them much lighter. So we looked at the sling jaw wrasse, and we knew we would have to look carefully at the jaw design, uh, and look at the four-bar mechanism in the jaw, the sling jaw wrasse. So what we did, we took computer tomography, x-rays, so that we could get fine detail, of the jaws. This was quite challenging because I didn't have any sling jaw wrasse in the United Kingdom. But I was, I was very lucky, my Chinese student, uh, she went back to China and she knew she had a friend who had some pet sling jaw wrasse. 
and uh, at that time they were alive, and she uh, had a conversation with a friend explaining how important her PhD was to her, so important that her friend should be prepared to part with her sling jewel rest. So her friend did, and somehow they got, she managed to kill them, and they came back in the suitcase to the United Kingdom, and this is an x-ray of one of the uh, sling jaw rats. And here we had the jaw in and the jaw out. So what you're seeing is the amazing movement of the jaw in the bottom picture. Even though uh, we killed the rats and we took the skin off, dissected them, we could still move the jaw in and out. We did these x-rays. And as with the dragonfly and the ring bill girl, we were amazed and astounded at the brilliance, the precision of design. We were awestruck. Uh, again, what we discovered with the sling jaw ras is that it had a double four bar mechanism, one on one side of the jaw, one on the other side of the jaw. It's a little bit like the bird wing. The jaw comes out like this, it shoots out like that on a mechanism. And even though the, the sling jaw ras doesn't have pins and bearings, it had all these little guides. You can actually see one of the guides on the top, this little archway, had these beautiful precision <laughs> guides to guide the mechanism to work smoothly. And so we were just awestruck and inspired. We analysed the performance of the mechanism by looking at the equations of motion of the fish. Uh, lovely thing about being an engineer, you can apply physics and understand <coughs> how things move and how things uh, work. And then we implemented the four bar mechanism onto an exoskeleton. On the left is a model of our exoskeleton. On the right, you can see an example of a four bar mechanism in the thumb. And we then were able to test this on an actual stroke patient, which was a really wonderful thing to, to make something and then actually get it to help someone in need. So on the left, on the left is the heavy, old exoskeleton. On the right, this lady who's had a stroke has our exoskeleton, and it's so light she can lift up her hand in to get into a cupboard to hold a jar or a cup. And she said it was a really good to have a light exoskeleton. We've published work on this uh, in some journals, and the last publication here is actually the PhD thesis of the Chinese student, and she was awarded that uh, in the last three weeks. So, again, this is very much hot off the press, <coughs> this case study. So that was the second example, and my third and final example is a bio-inspired knee joint. I've been working a lot on knee joints in the last 15 years, a really fascinating um, area. There's a need in both robotics and prosthetics for stronger and better knee joints. And there are a lot of challenges in producing a bio-inspired knee joint. Here you can see a knee joint uh, working. In the knee joint, you have what's called a cam mechanism because your knee joint is unusual. It rolls. It doesn't just slide. It rolls like a cam. And not only that, but there is a four-bar mechanism in your knee. So here I have my Technic Lego, and you can see four bars and four pins if you want to impress your neighbours and friends, get one of these four bar mechanisms and then if you turn it, you can invert it and produce a hinge. This is called an inverted parallelogram four bar mechanism and that is what you have, or I hope you have, in each one of your knees. The red bars represent the cruciate ligaments. It's a beautiful mechanism but it's compatible with that CAM mechanism. It has the, exactly the same motion and amazingly, a human knee can move 100 million times in a lifetime. And uh, if you don't have diseases, it can work smoothly for that whole time. Uh, we did lots of anatomical studies of real human knees. Once again, we were amazed and awestruck at the precision of design, the beauty of design, and the elegance <coughs> of design. I had a French student who worked on this project and uh, together with myself we tried to solve the mathematics of the CAM mechanism and the four bar mechanism 
the way we, we solved the, the whole design was that we would start with a femur bone, a complete femur bone. We would start with a complete four-bar mechanism. We would then move the femur bone and we would generate the tibia bone at the bottom. If you look carefully from this diagram, you can see lots of intermediate points and the tibia bone is generated. And we solve the mathematics. We would solve 300 points and then join the points to produce the tibia. I was really uh, thrilled and happy when we managed to crack this. And my PhD student produced this diagram. Having said, well done, I then immediately said, OK, but now I would like you to do 10,000 different knee joint designs to see if the human knee joint design is the best design. Uh, he went away and later wrote me an email threatening to resign, uh, accusing me of being a hard taskmaster, which I can't, I can't believe that. But uh, the French are a little bit temperamental, so I worked on them a bit, and he did actually, in the end, he did do the 10,000 designs, uh, and later he got his PhD, he's a very good student, and here are some of the diagrams he produced, uh, showing the performance of 10,000 different knee joint designs, showing the relative performance, like <coughs> range, and the amount of sliding and rolling, the mechanical advantage. And we showed that the human knee joint is a brilliant design, an optimum design. We then produced a practical implementation. You can see the knee joint here, but I even brought this all the way from the United Kingdom to show you. Uh, it's been around the world. Got it through the Australian customs. And this is the knee joint uh, working the femur bone at the top and the tibia at the bottom and you can see the ligaments uh, working I think someone wants this over there um, I'll see you afterwards <laughs> that's actually being implemented on a robot uh, and the next stage will be to look at uh, prosthetics so you might have to wait a little while um, so we have a uh, Several publications, Th these are just two of the publications I have on this knee joint. These are on, uh, in the ASME journals, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the top journals in the world for mechanical design. One of these papers published last year, and the next paper on the 10,000 designs is going to be published uh, in a couple of months' uh, time later this year. Again, the conclusion is clear that in creation... There is supreme design, not bad design. I could uh, talk about other areas of research. I've worked on the peacock feathers. I've worked on automotive styling. I've worked on the structural efficiency of trees. Again, I could show publications where the conclusion is there is supreme design in the natural world. So what are the conclusions? Well, every area of bio-inspiration, it doesn't matter which area you look at, shows nature contains supreme design. And it's observational science, not some little theory or story. It is real observational science. Bio-inspiration reveals a creator and his attributes, his power, his incredible wisdom, and his goodness uh, in uh, filling the world with wonderful creatures uh, and things that are so useful for man. And human design is a right to copy nature. There are thousands, tens of thousands of engineers looking to nature for inspiration. They're doing the right thing. I wish all of them would give credit to the creator, but they are doing the right thing. Just a little caveat I would make. Death and disease are due to the fall, not due to bad design. If you, had a bad, if you have a bad knee, either you've, had, you've got a disease or a mutation, or you've had an accident, it's not due to bad design in terms of geometry and dimensions. Your knee joint is a brilliant design. Just to mention uh, about irreducible design, some of you might have heard of this concept of irreducible design. A four-bar mechanism cannot evolve because it needs four bars, four pins, all at the same time. It's an irreducible design. And when I saw all of these four-bar mechanisms in uh, creatures... I was very eager to see what evolutionists would say about how, they, how could they have evolved by chance. So I, I was in a great rush to the biology library, and I fished out, or I, that's a bit of a pun, I, I got hold of a paper 
on supposedly that would tell me how fish jaws evolved. Supposedly. And this is what it said. Uh, several unusual breakthroughs in skull evolution uh, have happened. And that is a really interesting comment. I write lots of papers myself, I review lots of papers, so I can tell you what this means. What he means is, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> I haven't got a clue how fish jaws could evolve. So that's what breakthroughs means. You know, everything, suddenly there's a breakthrough. Then at the end of the paper, he says, the evolution of these jaws is punctuated by major transitions in engineering design. Acts like... It's as if he's been converted by the end of the conclusion, which I, that'd be wonderful if it was true. I'm a bit sceptical that's actually happened, but it's as if he's saying, well, uh, you know, yeah, it was it designed, wasn't it? So I find this just amazing. And this confirmed everything I had found, that fish jewels are designed, they're not evolved. Um, as you can see, I'm very enthusiastic about four-bar mechanisms. So I just thought I'd tell you, you are surrounded by four-bar mechanisms, there are lots in cars and buses. Uh, next time you're on a bus, look at the windscreen wipers, four-bar mechanisms. You're steering in a motor car, it's a four-bar mechanism. If you have double-glazed windows, they're on a four-bar mechanism, pliers. Uh, I'm very grateful to my hosts. I've just stolen their uh, food um, clippers. Uh, this is a four-bar mechanism. Very good for reaching out for the, the salad uh, because it gives you extended reach and it makes the gripping more efficient. You see, the thing about four-bar mechanisms is it gives you sophisticated motions, precise layouts, magnified forces. Four-bar mechanisms are the bread and butter of a good mechanical engineer. You can do amazing things with the four-bar mechanism. We're surrounded by them. But that shows me that creation has a designer who probably likes mechanical engineering. But creation has a designer because only a designer can produce a four-bar mechanism. But finally, uh, the final section, just to tell you a bit about the battle of origins, because creation evolution <coughs> is such an important battle, perhaps the most important battle in the church today. And I know some of this from first experience. In fact, I've had more experience than I wanted uh, of this. Uh, the battle is a battle of worldviews. It's not, it's not faith versus science. It is one worldview versus another world view. Evolution is an atheistic world view, excludes God. Creation is a biblical world view that includes God. Um, if you buy my book, Core Marks of Design, in the foreword, you'll see it is by Professor Anna Linton, a microbiologist, distinguished microbiologist, and he writes, evolution is a man-made theory. It's not a science, it is a worldview, a man-made worldview. Very brave of him to write that, uh, although he was retired. Um, I said, why did you wait till you were retired to write that kind of thing? He said, well, well I would have been retired uh, or sacked or demoted if I wrote that before I was retired. Um, even journalists can see the battle. There was an article in 2006 in the national newspaper. You can see a picture of Richard Dawkins he was described as a pin-up boy for evolutionists. Um, I'm at the bottom. I was described as a pin-up boy for creation. Never been a, described as a pin-up boy before. And here, Dawkins is looking grumpy, and I have a smile on. That pleased me quite a lot. Um, so the article wasn't too bad. Here is a really serious point. Academics are bullied if they question evolution. And many academics have found this. And many academics keep quiet because they don't want to be uh, bullied. But we can ask the question, why is there bullying? Why? Evolutionists cannot uh, present convincing evidence. CMI do a really good job of making this point. There <coughs> isn't any convincing evidence for evolution. And hardline atheists do not want evolution to be questioned. I choose my terms carefully here, because it wouldn't be fair to say all evolutionists don't want it to be questioned. That, that's actually not true. But what is true is that there's a very vocal, hardline, atheistic lobby group who do go around bullying and are very successful in stopping people questioning evolution. 
There are exam many examples of this. If you watch the DVD, Expelled, it has examples of academics being bullied. Uh, some time ago, the National Trust in Northern Ireland was bullied into removing some brief mentions of creation in a display on the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. And I think bullying is an evidence against evolution. Why is the evolutionist so defensive, so worried, unable to even discuss whether their theory is true? It's an evidence against it. It's also an evidence for what the Bible says about scoffers and the battle of evolution creation. I've written books on design in nature by day one publications. These are the books here. The one on the left is uh, supplied by CMI. The three on the right are not yet, but hopefully soon in the future they might be supplied by CMI. Uh, and my books present purposeful design and beauty in nature. It presents evidence of irreducible design, added beauty, even over-design of the human being. And it explains the attributes of the creator, his wisdom, his power, his goodness. Because the aim is not just to show the truth of creation, but to encourage Christians to know that they have a great and wonderful creator. When I produced these books, I wondered what reaction there would be. And the reaction was uh, more exciting than I thought, because uh, there was a lot of negative reaction from the atheists. And several atheists wrote to my university asking them, to take action against me, to sack me, demote me, lots of letters. Here's an example to the vice chancellor and the marketing director. Does the university endorse this material, you know, my books? Does the university approve its name being attached? Because I wrote, I was from Bristol University. And notice how this journalist asked these leading questions and then says, well, if the answer to the previous questions is you don't approve, then what are you going to do about it? You know, what action are you going to take? Goading the university to take action. I'm very thankful that my university wasn't goaded into action, despite these very provocative uh, letters. You know, what are you going to do about this creation scientist? I've had personal threats from organisations like the Brights, an atheist organisation in the UK. Uh, here's one example. Dear Stuart, I've heard that you welcome discussions with your students about design in nature, well I do teach that subject so it's quite difficult not to do that, we would regard such a situation as being very serious and would seek to ensure you are called to account. Very threatening. Uh, then they would often have this kind of thing, as always we wish to be fair before proceeding to the next stage. <laughs> and uh, they never told me what the next stage was. Abduction, assassination, torture. <laughs> um, so I just had to, my, mind boggling. There are other really horrible websites uh, as well. The British Centre for Science Education, they have described me as the most dangerous person in the United Kingdom. So it's very brave of you to have me uh, here tonight. And at the bottom of that uh, little message, it says we plan to write to the heads department at Bristol University, which they did. Um, I didn't know they were going to do that. The first I knew of it was when I had an email one day from a famous physicist, Sir Michael Berry, FRS, Fellow of the Royal Society at Bristol, <coughs> and he emailed me and he said, Stuart, someone said that you're saying I work for the devil. Is that correct? And I thought, wow, where did this come from? Uh, a complete mystery to me, so I got into conversation with him and he explained where the email had come from, this atheist uh, organisation, and when I told him that this organisation, they hardly have a secondary education qualification between them. They're just a bunch of fanatical terrorists. Um, he was appalled at their tactics, and it actually backfired on the atheists. <coughs> so I became friends with Sir Michael Berry. He actually came to my inaugural lecture uh, when I became pro a full professor, and it was a great honour to have him there. And some of my colleagues were quite jealous, my engineering uh, colleagues. So often it backfires when the atheist does those attacks. I was once having coffee uh, in the coffee room and I saw on the front page of a national newspaper this headline, Intelligent Design Creeps Onto Courses. Uh, a very unfair headline. It's implying that intelligent design must be a bad thing and there's no rational reason 
uh, to say that. One of my colleagues, who's not a Christian, he said to me, Stuart, there's a, an amazing quote inside in big, bold letters. It says this, evolution is disastrous because if you teach people that they're animals, it is inevitable that they will behave like animals. And I said to my colleague, wow, I, I agree with that, uh, but whoever said it is very brave, and if it's an academic, they'll probably get sacked. Who said that then? And he said, well, there's a picture of them and their names under the picture. Um, it was on the next page of the newspaper. And he said, it's you. <laughs> it's got your picture and your name. Uh, and all my colleagues by this stage were finely tuned into the conversation. And my colleagues looked at me and they said, well, Stuart, it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> I did survive uh, that, actually. Um, because God is faithful. My testimony is, God is not just a great creator in the natural world, but he's also a faithful creator as well. He's sovereign in all the affairs of life, not just the natural world. I've had criticisms from Richard Dawkins. He's it's called me in a tiny minority. Burgess, well, he's just in a tiny minority. Actually, that's not true. I speak to many colleagues, non-Christians, even evolutionists, who are actually very sympathetic to the idea of intelligent design, even creation, but they won't admit it to the national press. So Dawkins isn't correct that the vast majority believe in evolution. Dawkins is not qualified on the science of design. Just look at this quote from Dawkins here. Dawkins, in, in one of his books, The Greatest Show on Earth, he says... A decent designer would never have perpetuated anything of the shambles of, and here he's referring to the insides of a human being. Uh, he's unaware that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He thinks we're a shambles. But the point I'm making is, he thinks he's an authority on design. He talks about a decent designer, as if he knows what a decent designer is. But he doesn't know what a decent designer is, because he doesn't know anything about design. He is not qualified in the science of design. I sometimes have to judge people for promotion to professor of engineering design, not just in my university, but other universities in Europe and the United States. And I look to see, do they have 100 papers in design? Have they designed anything <gasps> significant themselves? Richard Dawkins has no papers whatsoever in the science of design. He's got no training in design. If he took my first year design course, he would fail because he doesn't understand design. He has no experience. He hasn't designed anything. He hasn't even designed a door handle. And if he did, I would not trust it. <laughs> the point I'm making is very serious because I've mentioned already in my talk, design does not happen by chance. Design is difficult. It's really difficult. It takes a lot of creativity, it takes a lot of planning, it takes precision. Even assembling a product can cause problems. When I worked on spacecraft design, like the Envisat, for two weeks before launch, I would feel physically sick, wondering if my design would work. That Envisat satellite cost $1.4 billion, and I was told that my design was one of the, it could be a single point failure, and I would take responsibility for $1.4 billion if it did not work. And that made me feel physically sick. They don't teach you that at university, that kind of thing. The emotion of design, the difficulty of design. And Dawkins knows nothing of that. I wish he would design something to see how difficult design is. He dreams up these just-so stories, theories and stories, but he's detached from the real world. Some people say to me, Stuart, do you have any friends after all that hassle you've, you've got, uh, being on the front line, the battle? Uh, I do have a lot of friends. I have a lot of academic friends, as I said. They're very sympathetic to intelligent design. Great friends in CMI. I really admire their work in the Creation magazine, the other areas. I think they deserve Nobel Prizes in science for the work that they do, turning up modern evolutionary philosophy on its head. I even have a friend in government because uh, uh, several years ago I was awarded a design prize from the Minister of State for Trade and Industry. So I do know about design. I also have a friend uh, in the royal family 
because I sent a copy of my book, Hallmarks, to the Queen and Prince Charles, not expecting much to happen, but something did happen, because Charles wrote back, uh, and he said this, Dear Stuart, thank you so much for sending me a copy of your book, Hallmarks of Design. I'm going to use a quote uh, for my wreath lecture, which that lecture went out to 90 million people. And he made a wonderful quote uh, from my book, and he said this, Why should modern science rule out special creation? And in that quote of our future king, your future king, uh, in that quote, he's pointing out the big mistake of modern science, and it is a massive mistake, to rule out special creation, because there is no scientific, rational justification to say we cannot include God. It's irrational and unscientific. People like Isaac Newton were here today, they'd be astounded and appalled that modern science should do that. So that was a big encouragement. So what is the message of creation? Creation reveals a designer who is perfect in knowledge. Do not have any doubts at all. Creation has a designer. And be encouraged. A designer who is perfect in knowledge, in power, in wisdom, in goodness. Uh, the wonders of creation shows not just there is a God, but God cares. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field and their beauty, and then you can remember that God cares for you. We have a wonderful God. To God be the glory. But there's a warning of scripture. No one has an excuse not to believe. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. And when you study by inspiration, uh, there is absolutely no excuse not to believe in a creator a wonderful creator. Thank you. Amen. Uh, just to mention briefly, um, I do actually have uh, three copies of this booklet on the design of man. I have just one copy of He Made the Stars. Also, there at the front, my son will sort you out. But the rest of the books are at the back. Do please look carefully at uh, Evolution's Achilles Heels. It's going to become a classic. Do look at that book. And my book, Hallmarks of Design, is also at uh, the back. So please do look at that. Thank you. I wonder, could I ask, ask Barry Rothenberg if he could just step forward and give the vote of thanks, please? Well, what a night, hey? What a night. I, uh, I have, uh, in fact, says three thank yous to deliver. First of all, for the Creation Ministries people, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for travelling, thank you for coming, and thank you for this work that you tirelessly do. Thank you for all the information that you have given us, speakers. shown things from two different uh, areas, large areas. So my question to you all tonight is this. 
What are you going to do with that information? You all have information. You know that old adage that if I had an idea or a thought, and Seth has, for instance, an idea and a thought, we both have what? One thought each. But if we were to share those thoughts, we would have two or more. Will you, in Christ's name, share this information tonight? It's needed. You saw the quotation when we first started. These are the times when we are to be edified, to be strong in Christ, and to stand for Him, and not be ashamed of Him, and to speak to the world. Thank you. but maybe there's some people here that uh, aren't quite clear on it or maybe have more questions that they would like to ask uh, Professor Burgess as you've learned a very, very, very clear bad uh, given the gift of uh, God in a wonderful way and David catch Paul maybe they would like to you would like to ask them some questions here in, in public, so if uh, they're prepared to answer, you go ahead with uh, some questions that you may have. Uh, also, um, after answering a few questions, people can ask us questions in private, because uh, we do want to leave enough time for looking um, at the books at the back. So perhaps a few questions. Was there one here? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued by your um, relation to PECOM affairs. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've done uh, work published in the Institute of Physics looking at the digital pattern of the peacock feathers. Uh, peacocks produce colours by optical interference, thin film interference. They're not pigment colours, but what's called structural colours. Very colours with a deep luster and iridescence. And I've published work in the Institute of Physics. I've also published in the CMI Creation, uh, or the, the CMI Research Journal, uh, showing that such peacock feathers could not evolve by chance, uh, be particularly because of the digital pattern. There's no natural process that could produce those patterns. It's beauty for beauty's sake. It's added beauty. And in that uh, research journal in, with CMI, that was about 10 years ago, uh, I reviewed the theory of sexual selection to show that evolution cannot produce a, a convincing argument at all as to how such beauty could evolve by chance. And no wonder that Darwin said the peacock feather made him feel physically sick, because he could see. And in many ways, Darwin has a, a lot of honesty that some modern evolutionists don't have. Darwin could see beauty was a real problem for the theory of evolution. Okay, by inspiration, engineers have used uh, that in a couple of ways, the peacock feather. They, it's now possible to buy a car, it's a bit expensive, but you can buy a car with iridescent flakes of paint. So if, 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 you, if you want such a car, you can have a car that looks different colours from the different, I mean, they're very expensive, but that's partly by inspired by peacocks. Secondly, uh, the next generation of <coughs> mobile phones could have displays based on butterfly and peacock, individual segments, uh, much kinder on the eyes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which would be good for the young people, especially if they use their mobile phones too much. It'll be safer with peacock-like display screens. So, thank you for that question. Any other okay, questions? We'll maybe have one or two other questions, if there are any, and then we'll allow you to go and have a look at the books and purchase books. Which we undoubtedly want to do that. Okay, one well, question now. Some of my skeptical friends would say that if you have a, a long enough time, anything's possible, 
and I get the impression you're saying that when things are complicated, it's less likely to be designed. How do you how do you settle that kind of a discussion with endless periods of time? Anything's possible. How would you respond from a design standpoint? Okay, saying given enough time, it's a bit of a cop out. Well, it is a cop out. If you have a four bar mechanism like a parallelogram mechanism, even if you have infinite time, you cannot evolve that step by step. Uh, in fact, in one sense, the longer you have, the worse it gets. Because if you study what's happening in the natural world, um, I've seen a paper on peacock feathers that shows beauty is decreasing, not increasing. And if you look at studies in many parts of the natural world, everything is in a state of decay. Humans are in a state of decay, peacocks are in a state of decay. The longer you go, the more things will decay. Every year, many hundreds of species become extinct. No new creatures are evolving. So the more time, the worse it gets. Um, but of course, ultimately, we believe by faith. And so you cannot uh, prove it you know, in a scientific sense. Creation is correct, <coughs> evolution is not correct. The evolutionists will always come out with, well, given time, given this. But I've been interested in my, my experience, how often an evolutionist, it's happened with the knee joint as well. I've had an evolutionist write to me and say, I admit, we don't have a clue how that could evolve, but I have faith. And ultimately, both sides have faith. So ultimately, you have to say to your friend, well, you have faith in your billions of years, and I have faith in what I see before my very eyes, which is what looks like a created world. Um, so you can't demolish every single argument, but that's a, like a clutching at straws. To say, well, given enough time, that's called scraping the barrel and clutching at straws um, and showing the faith. Yeah, thank you for those two questions. Is there another question? Yes, there's one lady there. That will have to be the last question. Okay, one last one. Yes. Um, so you're in bioengineering and different professors say limits in, in mathematics. Yeah. Do you have a list of different professors within the UK that are professing Christians that um, in all of the different various fields within the university? That's a really interesting question and perhaps I should do that. Um, I do know professors like Paul Garner, um, uh, Andy McIntosh, um, and some of the ones you've mentioned, yeah, there is, um, there certainly is a group. What's slightly difficult is, there are those who are happy to be um, told. I know lots and lots and lots of professors who are very sympathetic, who would say, don't publish a list, don't publish a list, because that list will get spread around the internet, and letters will be get written to vice-chancellors, sack this person, sack that person. So that will be the, that will be the challenge in such a list the list will be quite difficult to be a real list because uh, lots of people don't like to be on such a hit list, uh, which is what it would be become. It's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, interesting question. Okay, thank you for that. You can come and see us individually, but do look at the books at the back um, and particularly the books mentioned, Achilles' Heels and Hallmarks of Design. Thank you. All right, thank you. run out of time. There is a cup of tea and coffee and maybe some biscuits and uh, Ian here is going to thank those that yeah, have been please, yeah. uh, all the eats and the cup of tea and coffee. Yes, well, I, I hope uh, you're all uh, agreed with us. Ah, pity, pity. Uh, oh, no. Did they say you're on your computer? Yes, on Saturday.